Are you willing to accept Christ's invitation to know Him more intimately, love Him more intensely, and follow Him more closely, and then go out into the world and live His good news? If you say yes, then you could be the 13th Apostle. Join Dan Duddy and Tom Caffrey, the odd couple of Catholic Radio, as they ride the radio waves two by two to share the goodness, beauty, and truth of Jesus Christ and His Church. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the 13th Apostle. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of the 13th Apostle, where we explore the good, beautiful, and true of the Catholic faith, the Catholic Church, and since Catholic means universal, it covers everything, including the founding of the American Republic. That was Dan Duddy. You know, you probably had to hold on to your seats. This was, uh, we did it in reverse today. <laughs> Dan Duddy with the uh, preamble to, uh, not to the Constitution, but to uh, 13th Apostle. And uh, this is Tom Caffrey. And we are talking about our, obviously, for those of you who are living in this country, United States of America, uh, and actually, probably many of you, whoever, if you're listening, wherever you're listening, this is this has become almost a universal document, and we can talk about that in a little bit. But uh, Dan, when you were, you know, we always do research for these programs. So when you were doing research on this, is there is there anything you learned about the Declaration of Independence? Well, I did. I mean, I looked at it from a whole different slant or point of view because of where our political affairs are at the moment. Uh, I gave this assignment, actually, up as we went into this episode today. I gave it to my young, innocent uh, eighth graders. And they're, they're beautiful. Well, they're eighth graders two weeks ago. Now they're heading into freshman year. And I teach theology to a high school. So I'm teaching a summer school to these freshmen, incoming freshmen. So I gave it to their, I would say, innocent minds that we would explore the Declaration of Independence and look for the evidence of God in this declaration. And they all admitted to having never really read it before, except maybe in fourth grade, they said. But they said they didn't realize how how religious this document really was and how profoundly tight it was with regards to uh, a love for God and having God be in the universal uh, you know, provider of all that is necessary for a country to thrive and then they made comments like we don't really we don't really see this today so there's an insidious fading going on of the declaration and what it's written about what it stands for or or stood for obviously people like you myself and our listeners need that it needs to be reeled back in and retrieved but those innocent minds were really interesting and in the first paragraph for example it is stated that, uh, you know, at the powers of the earth that separate the equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. They're talking about the separation of the king to the new country. They went back to Genesis and they talked about nature and God and how, how God is our God and how God took nature and really cleansed his own earth several times in Genesis. And you, you have your theology degree, so you know you could describe that more so than I can. But they went all the way back to the New Testament. How many of our, uh, we'll say, social media religious experts are talking about, you know, the coming of the next flood and so forth? They don't know that. They don't even go there, these youngsters. And they're saying, well, this looks like one of those, this looks like a, another repeat of those times, you know? I thought, I thought that was very interesting. And, uh, you know, for now, I hope that kind of answers your questions. But they sensed, before I hand the mic back over to you, they sensed more than, I would say, there's four times in the Declaration where it's outright God. But they sensed God and a love for God throughout several other places in the Declaration that I didn't, which was pretty cool in their innocence to see. Well, you know, this is, you know, it. I'm struggling, not because of the difficulties of my voice, which are back, and just like you're struggling with 
your voice for a different reason. It's more because this document and the history behind it and what it means going forward, always future-oriented, always overwhelms me. And uh, it makes me think of the quote attributed to uh, President Kennedy uh, at a dinner that was honoring Nobel laureates. And he talked about the last time there was this much intelligence, you know, and, and, and vast human knowledge was when Thomas Jefferson died alone. <laughs> that is, and he was in his 30s when he did the yeoman's work of writing. He didn't do it all. Uh, he had editors. And Jefferson did not like having editors. Um, but he had editors review, take things out of his draft. The, the strategy behind it, Adams, you know, who was, he was the man in terms of, you know, the initial founding and whatnot. Uh, and he knew enough for a variety of reasons, one of them being Jefferson was from the South, you know, from Virginia. And that having Jefferson write it, who Adams also acknowledged Jefferson was a better writer, um, not a good orator, but a better writer. So he had Jefferson do it. But it was for political reasons, too. And to know what they, there was a group of five. Uh, it was Adams, Jefferson, Ben Franklin, Roger Sherman, and Robert Livingston. And who were charged by Congress to put this declaration together. And you think about it, Great Britain was the greatest power the world had ever known. And, you know, here's this group. Somehow, <laughs> they're, they're putting it out there, saying, you know, we disagree with you, King George the Third. And uh, and they, you know, as you, as you said, you know, they brought they brought everything to this document, including the power of of God. I mean, the, the four references to you know we could say God you know, the, of nature and nature's God, as you said, right. endow endowed by our Creator, appealing to the supreme Judge of the world, a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. You know, you say, well. Was this a religious document? Say it's well, maybe not. Can't say a formal religious document. Say it's a moral document. Right. You know, a document that with morality running through it. If that's true, then we have to try to reconcile the equality Jefferson described in that document with his ownership of hundreds of slaves, hundreds of God's children. Yeah, that's a powerful. That's a powerful cog in the midst of the general universality of tolerance and unalienable rights. That's huge because that that jumps right in there. There's also a mention of, I believe, savage uh, savage Indians, our Native American Indians, in, in this as well. We're using the word savage, but unalienable. It was brought up in our discussion. I'm just going to go back to what happened today because it was probably the best thing I ever did. Mr. Duddy, what does unalienable mean? And we talked about what that means. That it's a done deal. It's built in. It's uh, you know, it's it's end all be all. It's it's undeniable, unalienable rights. It's built into creation, and then it, that led to life itself, and it led to a huge, as you can imagine, and what's fundamentally right that it did turn into it, a huge discussion on on abortion and the rights of of life in the womb. At conception, and once again, this this document powerfully made its made its thrust through the classroom into uh, into the truth of such. And another key phrase that came up all the way down near the bottom of the document is the term "sacred honor" and how that leads back to life itself and the pursuit of happiness. And, and I'm going to read that section. And there's the, you just mentioned divine providence, I believe, right? Mm -hmm. It goes, 
and, and for the support of this declaration with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. We mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. And that's just so powerful. And back to the word pledge, I did a little reflection on from Hillsdale today. And the power of the pledge, as you and I know, we talk about this in masculinity and manhood, and how there's a loss, antithetically, there's a loss to the, of that word, the word vows. And it comes from really a generation that is compromised when it comes to resolve, resolution. But it was very refreshing to hear these young people, once again, who really truly expressed in their heart that we need to resurrect resolve and vows and make them absolute. And that this is a pledge. And that allegiance to uh, something that we all point to and stand for is one thing like the Declaration of Independence. But moreover, the Declaration points to God, the Father in Heaven, as the universal protector of the whole world. And, wh and what does that do? It gives muscle to the United States of America as the big brother for the country in the area of morality and values. And we, we used to be able to say that profoundly about the Catholic Church. Amen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not sure that we can in this moment. I went to Robert Barron this morning on my way to work. I like him. I expressed that last week when we talked. And he talked about the cracks of the Declaration of the United States of America. And he also referred back to St. Pope John Paul II. And I think that's when, you know, because he had done some powerful things for the world and consecrations and things, so forth. I don't know if you want to get into it today, but. But he felt that there was a crack in the magisterium big time with regards to standing up you know, for life and what the Declaration of Independence truly stands for. And that there's a there's a cohesion between the magisterium and the intentions of the original intentions of the Declaration of Independence that needs to be resurrected. And ideally, ideally, I could never, ever disagree with that. Well, there were cracks in the Liberty Bill. Yeah. Oh, good one. There's, yeah. You know, there's always there's always cracks, and they they increase the fragility of of something. But we go on, and you know, if you can't ring that particular bell, you ring another bell. You know, you you make, and I think that's one of the things. You know, when when the shots were fired at Lexington and Concord. You know, proverbially, the shot the shot heard around the world, so to speak, and what it portended for the U.S. And as you know, generally we say one man, as one man fell, another one. You know, if somebody was holding the standard, the stars and stripes. Okay, another, you know, another was there uh, to pick it up. You know, the, what your students should know is what Ben Franklin said. You know that if we don't hang together and make this work, commit ourselves to it, we are going to hang separately at the end of a yeah, rope. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so to get back to the, uh, you know, you, you say you, you tied in with abortion and pro-life and stuff like that. I know that I've heard many times the objection because of Jefferson and slaves and, and other slaveholders. But it's clear to me, that, and it's easy for me to say because I was not enslaved, but Frederick Douglass knew this. Others knew it. Booker T. Washington eventually knew it. Uh, others. That this is an aspirational document. You know, it's kind of like, you know, with the Constitution and whatnot, in order to form a more perfect union, you know, we're not there yet. Right. But we can be, or we can work toward that. And obviously, you know, the the impact of the Declaration is, well, unlike any other document that's ever been written, in terms of, you know, more than a hundred nations have uh, a declaration of some sort of Declaration of Independence. Many of them received inspiration from or 
referred directly to our declaration. You know, that's countries like Venezuela, not a bastion of freedom, what we would say, but still. Venezuela, Austria, Central, Central European nations, the Liberia, Vietnam, Vietnam of all places, you know, and on and on. So it's, uh, I mean, Ho Chi Minh, you were talking about the Vietnam War. I mean, he was, uh, he, he altered it somewhat, but he still used part of the, uh, of, of that document. Yeah. So I, I think that, you know, we'd have to say, especially for you, again, your youngsters, but it obviously it applies to everybody, and all this applies to everybody, is what is the pursuit of happiness? What is the happiness that Jefferson and others uh, of, the, of that group, what were they referring to? Yeah. What do you think they were referring to by, what do you think I, that phrase means, happiness, pursuit of happiness? I think, I, think it, I think it's connected absolutely with true freedom, that we can live, and I like to use the term in, in my ministry, that we can live the powers and talents that were innately, you know, uh, created into each and every one of us to be the person that we are with all the freedoms that's granted through our very own creation, our intended creation. Uh, I firmly believe that with all my heart that that we can be who, who we are, who we are meant to be, without the the oppression of of a King George. They say he had excited domestic insurrections amongst us. And he had endeavored to bring us all down. And what's scary is those are the same accusations that we're hearing today in the United States of America. They said that King George had plundered our seas, ravaged our, our coasts, and, and burnt our towns. Burnt our towns. Sounds familiar. And destroyed the lives of our people. But as far as you, you said the words aspirational, and it, and it returns to being aspirational again here in 2024. It's also inspirational. But it's also a little bit dark and it's revealing because we're hearing the same things right now about about our leadership, that insurrections were, were caused by leadership and that that's scary. Like it's aspirational yet. Yes, let's get back. Let's get underneath these bad King George terms that we're hearing about, you know, totally totally justifiable but can we ever reunite and say yeah i mean by the by the nature of just changing our our perspective and our perceptions of political leaders can we then get back to this aspirational document again it's a really big it's a really big if uh well maybe if it was another king george the third uh who sets his military against us and starts burning our towns and our harbors and whatnot. Uh, I mean, you know, the White House burned, you know, the War of 1812, you know, so the English hadn't quite learned their uh, uh, their lesson. Um, you know, it's, you come together because there's, because there's this common enemy. Well, it's hard to see today, especially when well, you have the internal... You know, I mean, not everybody, a lot of people didn't want, I mean, even the founders, for the longest time, they didn't want to separate from England. I mean, they considered themselves, because they were, English. Yeah. And they tried and tried with King George to appeal to him, and he would have none of it. And so when the final olive leaf was extended, he rejected that. Yeah. All bets were off. Yeah, it's a conflict <clears throat> of objective truth Verse subjective truths, and you can you can feel it right in this very document. And of course, that's what we're struggling with today in 2024. The other the other term that comes up profoundly, the whole document is really founded upon it, is the cardinal virtue of prudence. Prudence is mentioned in this document. I don't think we I don't think we could throw the word prudence out for this country today. I think it would it would just it would cause a riot because prudence is prudence is just it's so subjective. It's self-serving now today. The prudence gets stomped on today. I don't think it exists today. But this document profoundly did. Once again, aspirational. To have this resurrected again today is truly, we must aspire to do it. But I think we're in a little bit of a mess, Tom, and I'm an optimist. I don't know how we can come back to it. Well, you're, you know, you're talking about, I mean, prudence was recognized 
for the most part, I would say, from the, at least from everything I've read, like a lot of the virtues, you know, f- from it was one of the common bonds. We recognize that. Yeah. And thus, you know, you've got, you see, it's common. You, that's, you got Thomas Paine writing common sense. Right. You know, a massively impactful uh, document. Uh, so, and, and the founders were very influenced, you know, in their education. I mean, highly educated, most of them, uh, by the philosophers from ancient Greece and Rome. And, you know, so from the standpoint of happiness, I mean, you know, they had property in there in place of happiness, life, liberty, and property. But then they realized two things, or, well, at least two things, that a life of fulfillment didn't necessarily come from property. And property, as well as other things, could be taken away. Yeah. And they would be alienable. Right? You can make them alien because they could be taken away. But, yeah. you know, in their genius, they say, no, no, you know, the happiness, the happiness we're talking about is having life and liberty and security or safety, and depending on where you look in the documents, not the Declaration. It, oh, no, I'm sorry, it is in the Declaration, but in the support of documents and, and books since then, analyses of them, it's security and safety and or safety, you know, synonymous so that you could live a life. As a matter of fact, uh, they referenced Micah, speaking of biblical work, they, rec- they, they referenced Micah 4.4. 4. They shall all sit under their own vines, under their own fig trees, undisturbed and unafraid, for the Lord of hosts has spoken. So that was the reference by many of the colonists of what it meant to be to have life, liberty, and secu- and pursuit of happiness, and happiness because they would have security and to live their full life. It's a life of fulfillment, and that's where you get that, you know, the, the, they were describing not materialism or consumerism. They were describing a state of fulfillment or the process of living towards such a state as eudaimonia. That's E-U-D-A-I-M-O-N-I-A, eudaimonia, which is this, it's almost like this, um, the Christian agape love. And that's, uh, and it was, it was the state that resulted from doing good rather than feeling good. You know, and so uh, I think, and, you know, going back to that Micah chapter and verse, you know, when you were, when you made reference to the protection of divine providence, in a way, that's a little bit of an argument against deism. And a lot of people say, well, there's really no Christianity or very little Christianity in the founders. And, I mean, a lot of them were not Christians the way you and I are. Uh, but if you think, you know, that if you think that God is the God who, you know, the, the, the master clockmaker, okay, he wound it up and then he left. Well, yeah. you wouldn't ask for protection of divine providence if you didn't think that God could intervene. So, yeah. you know, there's, there's a lot, there's massive depth in that document. And if you get away from the grievances, I think there's about 27, 28, something like that, grievances. You, if, if you were, took that out, or maybe just referenced one or two, just to give an idea, but you look at the before and after the grievances of the Declaration, wow. There's no wonder why Lincoln referred to it, you know, glorified that. And one other thing, speaking of glorified, there's an interesting irony because less than a hundred years before the Declaration of Independence and before the revolution, our revolution, England had its own revolution. It's known as the Glorious Revolution. And they fought and won for a, a victory for Parliament over the, to separate from the king. Now, they still, in terms of the governance of the nation, and so they had the so they they had the revolution against their against their uh, uh, their king, and less than a hundred years later, their colony had, in in a sense, the same thing, a revolution. We didn't have a parliament; we had a congress. It's amazing. It's it's just amazing. 
Yeah. I know we're running out of time, but yeah. I, I got I to gotta tell you, that observation that you just made about taking the grievances out, there's nothing left behind but the truth of God himself and creation. I think we can all learn by that fundamental truth itself. And I really want to say that was a powerful way to end this episode uh, as we head towards the end. Uh, take the grievances away and what we have left is the truth of God himself and the universality and his, you know, the protection of his divine will. Yeah. Well, you could put your own grievance in. One grievance, let's say, that you have, but then see how that works with this, <laughs> with this, well, we'll call it eternal, I think it's eternal, this eternal document. Yeah, I was eternal. I think it'll That's... be when, when, when God thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven so when when god makes us all new creations yeah that we're going to see that document yeah and they see he's going, to, he's going to point to that yep the aspirational part of what, what you said earlier amen totally agree yeah all right brother what's coming up you want me to end up with that what you told me to yep. end up with mm -hmm. okay i am apt to believe that independence day will be celebrated by succeeding generations as the great anniversary festival. It ought to be commemorated as the day of deliverance by solemn acts of devotion to God Almighty. It ought to be solemnized with pomp and parade, with shows, games, sports, guns, bells, bonfires, and illuminations from one end of this country, this continent that is, to the other from this time forward forevermore. There you have it, forevermore, right? Yep. God Amen. Almighty. That's what you just God said, Almighty. yeah. Cool. Yeah. That's a great episode. Uh, thanks, Tom. I know your voice is struggling, but thanks so much for Thank stepping you, up. Thank you, Danny. Uh, stay tuned, folks, for The Angelus and your prayer intentions with our good friend Peter and Jimmy. WQPH Radio. <laughs> Thank you, Mary Ann. Gene, James, Tom, and the crew. Thank you, Danny. God bless you, brother. Thank you, Tommy. God bless you, Tommy. God bless you all. Thank you for listening to The 13th Apostle with Dan Duddy and Tom Caffrey. For more information on Dan, visit his website at www.danduddy.com or email dcduddy at gmail.com. Tom's website is faithpilgrims.com or email trcaffrey at faithpilgrims.com How about you? Will you be the 13th Apostle?